Good morning, Smith Memorial, and welcome to worship on this Sunday, November the 8th, 2020. I want to thank all of you for tuning in. My name is Daniel Gunther, and I have the privilege on another Sunday of being your pastor. We had a crazy week, didn't we? This past, these past few days have been kind of wild for all of us, and it is such a blessing for me to be able to worship with you all today, to be able to spend this time going to the God who, in the midst of all the chaos and change of our world, remains constant in love and faithfulness towards us. So let's go into our worship service with that attitude. Let's go into our worship service focusing not on the craziness of this world, but on the constant love that our God shows us and the constant love that we can always show our neighbors. Let's prepare to meet this God and let's prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God together. And now, friends, once again, let us affirm our faith in the God who stands firm in the midst of the craziness and chaos of our world, who reminds us all that we are holy, that we are loved, that we are called to love our neighbors, and that all of this is connected to the kingdom of God that God will someday bring. Let's recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now as we continue this time of worship, let's join together in a spirit of prayer as we begin the service. Today, our opening prayer is being led by our Director of Youth and Children's Ministries, Crystal Farmer. Good morning, church family. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for everyone who will watch this video. Thank you that even in the midst of a pandemic, that you give us ways to reach your people. Thank you for the opportunity to to reunite our hearts together and our minds to worship and to love you. Help us to open our hearts and minds to you. Help us to open ourselves up so that we can hear the messages that you want us to hear and use those messages to go out into your world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, once again, what a joy that we can begin our service of worship in, in such a full and rich and lively manner. First, by reciting the Apostles' Creed that connects us to the generations that came before the, the countless people who have recited that, that very same creed and have affirmed their faith in Jesus Christ. And then, of course, to have a time of prayer and a time of song. What a pleasure, what a joy, what a blessing, and thank all of you for being here and participating in that. We're starting a new tradition in the month of November. We are on our second, what I'm calling, Celebration Sundays, where, where we celebrate different components of the church. Last week, we celebrated the saints of the church, the people who have, who have gone by and who have made the church what it is. This week, we have the privilege of celebrating the community meal volunteers, the people who who participate in that ministry and the work that they do to keep our community fed and sustained, especially during this difficult time that we are currently in. As I invite all of you every week to contribute to this church out of the spirit of your generosity, to contribute financially to it, I hope that you can watch the video that we're about to see, that I'm about to show you, and see just how powerful those gifts are because of the things that those gifts make possible. Again, this is showing our community meal volunteers and the incredible work that they do. And I'm so excited for you all to see up close in person what makes them go. The community meal actually started uh, probably about 10 years ago mm -hmm. with uh, Betty Heaton and Carolyn Plaster. And they thought that it was a way to get the community uh, into the church and to bring the church out to the community. I started with my Sunday school class. We would take turns, different groups, join the community dinner when it was inside. And so I helped with that. Well, when the pandemic started, we were supposed to have a community meal two weeks. Well, we can have after we were quarantined, after everybody went into quarantine. So that's when we decided on frozen dinners and canned goods and just fixing a bag up of uh, food to hand out to people that came along. And we promoted it as a drive-through meal. And I think this really helps more people with more food. We get to interact with the, uh, the people that come to pick up the food. And they are so appreciative and just, I think it just lifts their spirits that we bring the food out to their car and put it in and they drive away knowing that in two weeks they can come again. So it's, it's something that I have come to enjoy doing, look forward to doing it and very thankful to be a part of this ministry. I like being able to help the community out and uh, it, it feels good doing something for other people. It makes me feel better. So I get probably as much or more out of it than the people that I'm helping. I, I don't care how many people we end up having <clears throat> to come to these. Somehow it always ends up that we have enough meal in the freezer for everybody to to be given something. Jesus has just, and God has just multiplied the gifts that people have brought in to serve more and more people in the community. Some people want to talk a little bit. Uh, they will tell you, you know, things about themselves or, you know, just talking about the food. But to see the people, the same people, over and over, you feel like, well, hey, this is somebody I know, mm -hmm. and so, and it would be nice if there was some way for the, the congregation, the people that have been so faithful to bring food, if, you know, they could have a glimpse of mm -hmm. what that bag of potatoes, a bag of apples, or whatever they bring, what that means to the people mm. giving it. I think Jesus really wanted us to share everything we have, mm. everything. And, you know, I, I think we're reaching a big population right now with this. Mm. And, you know, it's, I don't care if they drive in a Lex, in a Lexus and they come in for food, there's a reason they're here. Mm -hmm. You know, they either needed 
something for uh, someone else in their family or they're helping their neighbors. Uh, people come in for different reasons. And I just feel like that's exactly what Jesus wanted us to do. It's not, we're not, they don't have to fill out a paper and we don't have to judge, well, you might make too much or, you know. If you need it and you feel like you're led to come here, then we're going to give you something. I'm reminded of the scripture where, you know, Jesus said, if you do it to the least of these, you have done it unto me. So I think that this is this church being the hands and feet of Christ. What a blessing it is that we have this incredible ministry here at Smith Memorial UMC. If you were moved by the video that you just saw and you want to contribute to ministries like that, like the Community Meal, I invite you to go to our website, which is www.smithmemorialumc.com slash give to contribute to the life of this church financially. I say this every week, but thank you all so much for the gifts of your tithes and of your offerings. You are making the life of this church happen, and you are empowering this church to be a positive presence in this community, to make life better for people in this community, and to help us all to love our neighbors as ourselves. Thank you all for your generosity. Our scripture today comes from Luke Chapter 23, I'll be reading to you from verses 32 through 43. Listen now for the word of God. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let them save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Friends, this is the word of God for us all, the people of God. Have you ever thought about how much one chance one choice, one decision that you make can totally change your life? Take a moment maybe to ask yourself how your life might be different today if you hadn't been at that one place in that one time. If things had been just a little bit different here or there or anywhere. For me, my best example of this is my skiing accident, which I've talked about with you all a couple of times. If I don't get in my skiing accident, I start my ministry a year early. And I'd say there's a pretty good chance that I don't ever become your pastor without that accident. Who knows what might have happened? I'm sure you have moments like that too, moments that you can look back on and say, if I had gone left or gone right or gone straight, my life would have been totally different. 
in your personal life, in your faith story, in your professional life, I bet there are a million little moments that collectively brought you to where you are right now. In looking at our scripture passage for today, I can imagine that of all the people described in the passage, there were at least two people who were reflecting on this exact same phenomenon. They were thinking about all the little chances that they had taken, all the little choices that they had made, all the little decisions that they had chosen upon, and how those had collectively brought them to this moment right here. And I'd bet they were asking a question similar to, how in the world did it all come to this? I'm talking, of course, about the two criminals who are crucified next to Jesus. I'd bet as they were shackled, as they were pulled from the smelly darkness of their prison cells and marched out into the light towards this place called the skull, all the while receiving jeers and insults and mocking from the angry mob of Jerusalemites surrounding them, as they were led towards their crosses, I'd bet they asked questions like, how did it come to this? I'd bet they reflected thoroughly in those final moments on the chances they had taken and the choices they had made that brought them right here. Of course, there, there was a third person who joined them on a cross that day. Jesus was there with them too. These criminals would have known about Jesus. By this point, just about everyone in first century Palestine had heard his name. By this point, he was known to many people as a prophet, as a healer, and possibly, possibly, possibly as something more. Certainly there was disagreement as to what this could mean, but some were beginning to see him not just as a prophet and a healer, but as a Messiah, as someone who in some mysterious way could transform the world and turn it back in the direction that God had always intended it to go. Strangely enough, it's here in this moment as Jesus hangs on a cross and these two criminals hang on either side of him. It's the criminals, not the mobs of Jerusalem or the, the Roman legionnaires, but the criminals who see Jesus for what he is. They see him as a Messiah, as a deliverer, as a savior. We have no idea who they were but we can see in this moment that they recognize Jesus for who he is. Try to think then about how their state of mind would have changed as they recognized this. Try to imagine how they were feeling as they were led up in shackles, surrounded by a jeering and cheering mob towards this place called the Skull. And try to imagine how they, real, how they felt when they realized that Jesus, the Messiah, was already there, waiting for them. Do you think they felt a surge of hope? Maybe. And yet, this sight, this appearance, it seems to mean two different things for the criminals. One looks at Jesus and sees a, a get-out-of-jail-free card. He calls out to him, saying in equal parts an insult and a desperate plea, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. This man thinks of Jesus as the one who will rescue him from his current predicament, the one who will relieve him from his punishment, the one who will give him what he wants the one who is there to meet his needs and only his needs. If I'm honest, I hear echoes of my own prayers in his plea. 
even if my prayers don't come under such dire circumstances as life and death. When I was 11, I actually prayed to God and asked God to fix our DVD player because it wasn't working and I really wanted to watch Sean Connery and Alec Baldwin ham it up on a submarine in the classic Tom Clancy film, The Hunt for Red October. That's a, a silly example, of course, of this kind of phenomenon, but I think this criminal displays it well. He desperately wants a reprieve from his past actions. He desperately wants to be off of the cross. This man is thinking about himself and about what he wants above all else. And now he sees Jesus as an opportunity for him to get it. We have all prayed prayers that stress that point, haven't we? We have all asked God for a chance to get our way, a chance to get the results we want, to see things turn out the way we want them to turn out. And to be clear, that can sometimes be a valid thing to do. Sometimes. However, sometimes those sorts of prayers are proof that we have turned God into a blessings vending machine in our own minds. Sometimes they're a sign that we've forgotten that life in the kingdom of God is not simply us getting whatever we want whenever we want it. We don't know why these criminals are being crucified and it is certainly true that the validity of the death penalty is both debated and debatable as a form of punishment. But the fact remains that somehow this man had done something or some things that earned him the right to be up on that cross next to Jesus. For him and for us, calling out to our Messiah is not a free pass, not the lucky break that we are asking for. The hope we hold on to as Christians is and must be deeper than that, more profound than that, because it cannot and is not tied to us getting our own way in all things. We must hope for something else, something that has little to do with what we want and everything to do with deeper, more intrinsic human questions like, who am I? Where did I come from and where am I going? The other person next to Jesus was also a criminal. He had, it seems, also done some other terrible deed or deeds to merit crucifixion. Again, we have no idea what that was. No clue. But we can tell that he seems to understand what's going on here in a way that the other criminal does not. He's focused not on what he wants but on the injustice in front of him. The injustice of Jesus, an innocent man, dying before his eyes. How do you think that this second criminal got here, got to this point? What chances, what choices, what decisions do you think he made that put him on a cross next to Jesus Christ on this day? Did he grow up with loving parents who cared for him and met his every need, or did he grow up in a broken home? What turned him from a sweet, innocent little boy into a hardened, cruel man who could commit the kinds of acts that would merit crucifixion? in this world. It's actually not that hard for me to imagine him in the days, weeks, and months prior to his arrest, looking out at the window late at night, looking up at the night sky and watching the, the moon and the stars and all the beauty of the evening and thinking to himself, I was meant for something more than this. But I don't know how to stop. I don't know how to stop.
And now as he hung here at the end of his life, this man, this criminal, this man being crucified next to Jesus, he must have felt a a variety of things. Sadness, I'm sure, disappointment, maybe even shame. But to me at least, he seems also to have a measure of hope in him. Just a tinge perhaps, but still some hope all the same. Hope in the reality that now as he breathes his final breaths, his story could end where it had began. Being returned to the God who leaves nothing to chance. I think this criminal had heard about Jesus, known about Jesus, seen enough from Jesus to understand that here on the cross, a deeper game was afoot. He knew what we know, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that God created humanity in God's own image, and that even after humanity broke away and ran away from God, that God continued to pursue humanity. As he hung on the cross, this criminal could rest in the knowledge that God's pursuit of humanity had included and featured prominently coming to earth as a baby in a manger. As this criminal's arms weakened, he remembered how that baby had become a prophet and a healer, a man who healed the sick and proclaimed a gospel of truth, love, and liberation. As his shoulders began to give out, I imagine this criminal remembering, realizing, the moment that he realized that this prophet was more than just a prophet, but a Messiah who came to the earth to save the world from itself, one lost soul at a time. And as his breath began to shallow and his heartbeat began to weaken, this criminal looked to his side, And for one final time, saw the one who had sacrificed everything for him. And even now, even now, was still taking this final moment to dispense love. And all the terror of death, all the sadness, shame, disappointment, and heartbreak in the world could not stand against the truth that this criminal had been bound to God's love for all time by the Messiah who came to save us all, to save the world from itself. Whatever your story is today, however you feel about the world we live in, I hope that you can rest in the knowledge that your place in this world is not determined by chance. It's set in stone. It's put there by a God who loves you and who has suffered countless pains to claim you for all eternity. Friends, may we trust in that hope. May we trust in that knowledge that God has loved, does love, and will continue to love each and every one of you for all eternity, even to the point of death. And that because of this love, there is a day in the future in which God will say to you, to me, to all of us, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Friends, we will now enter together into a time of prayer. I invite you to join me in prayer and at the appropriate time to lift up your own prayer concerns as we pray in silence together. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the love that you have shown us. We thank you for the love that you continue to bless us with through your son, Jesus Christ. As the chaos of our world rages around us, 
as hope rises and falls. We know that you are steady, that you are steadfast, that you are holding on to us each and every day, each and every night, each and every hour, each and every moment we have. You are there keeping us safe. We have many things to pray over, holy God. Many fears we hold on to, many doubts we cling to. Hold us close in this difficult time. Cover us with your love and your nurturing spirit. Cause your grace to fall down on us like rain. Teach us a better way. Teach us the way of love, the way of compassion, the way of justice, the way of truth, the way of joy, the way of peace. Be with us. Hear us when we lift up prayers to you. Hear us when we call upon your name. Today we pray for Steve Foley, Barbara Foley, Jim and Katie Connolly. We pray for the Whitleys, for Garvin, for Jonathan Pace and the workers of North Georgia Hardwoods, for Tim Martin and his family. We pray for Mandy, Juanita Daniel, Tish Hadley. We pray for Teresa and for Emma. We pray for Ricky Stone, for Merle Duffy, for Sandra Kendrick, for Joyce Odie, for Thomas Duffy and Michael Duffy. We pray for Dana Leibengood, Francis Cooper. We pray for the family of LaVon Smith. We pray for Judy Meeks, Janet and Reggie Fulcher. We pray for the Shields family and Letcher DeHart's sister-in-law. We pray for Doris and Alan. We pray for the residents of Kings Grant. We pray for our nation that in this time of tension, fear, and doubt that you might show us all a better way. Your way of love, your way of peace, your way of acceptance, the way of compassion the way of justice, the way that looks with an unbending and an unbreaking hope towards the day of your coming and of the coming to earth of your kingdom. We also lift up the silent prayers that we hold on our hearts, the prayers that we keep to ourselves and the prayers that we lift aloud from the comforts of our own homes. We thank you, holy God, that you hear these prayers. That when we lift these prayers to you, you hear what we say. That you are not far from our hearts, but that your compassion knows no bounds. Again, Lord, we pray you teach us a better way. Teach us a way that looks something like your kingdom. Teach us also to have hope in you and the work that you are doing. We thank you for the life of your son, Jesus Christ, who has given us so much, shown us so much, and been with us through so much. He makes our church whole, makes it what it is. We pray that his love might continue to shine through to us and that we might mirror it in our own lives. 
And now together, we also pray the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. He set aside his beauty, he set aside his majesty to carry all our sorrows, to come and bear our griefs. When we like sheep had gone astray. The man of sorrows made the way Crushed for our iniquities His softened brow us peace With his wounds and by his stripes We can enter paradise This is the price of mercy This is the price he paid to win The hearts of all his people One day will be with him Because of one we now are saved The King of glory made a way Crouched for our iniquities His suffering brought us peace With His wounds and by His stripes We can enter paradise Oh Friends, once again, thank you for being here. Thank you for spending this time in worship with us. I'm going to end the service with my usual reminder to remember to love your God, to love your neighbors, and to love yourselves. In the end, I remain confident, I remain convinced that God's love is and will be triumphant in all things. As we go out into the world this week, let's live our lives that way. 
let's live our lives as if that is the expectation. That's a challenge these days. It's a challenge at any time because God's love is always going to appear radical and confusing and surprising in a world of fear and anger and sometimes hatred. But let's go forth out into the world with gladness and singleness of heart, trusting in God's love, trusting in the triumph of God's love, trusting that we can witness to that, and trusting that in the end, it will come to pass, and that we will all hear those magic words, today you will be with me in paradise. May it be so today, tomorrow, and every day hereafter. Amen.